All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part three of our Strategies to Reduce Environmental Cancer Risk webinar series. Um, my name is Caroline Powell. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the staff lead of the Iowa Cancer Consortium's Cancer and the Environment Task Force. Feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves. We have participants joining us from various areas of expertise across the country. So for anyone new, the Iowa Cancer Consortium is the state of Iowa's comprehensive cancer coalition of over 650 members. We are a nonpartisan, non-political organization, and we do not use state or federal funds to engage in lobbying. And the opinions and interpretation of the information shared by speakers and attendees in this webinar series do not necessarily reflect the positions of the Iowa Cancer Consortium, its board of directors, members, or staff. And the Consortium's Cancer in the Environment Task Force's role is to connect partners with resources, knowledge, and collaboration opportunities that help them succeed in practicing cancer control work through an environmental and occupational health lens and vice versa. And so now our year one CDC Public Health Associate, Brianna McNulty, will introduce today's speaker. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So my name is Brianna McNulty. I also use she, her pronouns. And as Caroline said, I am the year one CDC public health associate here at the consortium. In the third part of the series, Dr. Emily Hills, research scientist at the University of Texas at Austin, will be speaking about the health impacts of exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs in plastic and other commonly used products and how their informed use can help reduce exposure. Dr. Hill studies the inter- and transgenerational effects of endocrine-disrupting chemicals as a postdoc fellow in the lab of Dr. Andrea Gore. Her work primarily assesses the cognitive, neurological, and genetic impacts of EDCs using animal models. Dr. Hills received a National Research Service Award for this work in 2022 and is one of the phase one winners of the HHS OWH EDC Innovator Award for her outreach work developing a web app to screen for endocrine disruptors in personal care products. She is a member of the U.S. Endocrine Society, which is an organization of researchers at both the national and international level that aims in part to increase awareness and regulation of endocrine disruptors. Thank you for being here, Dr. Hills, and I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much for that great introduction and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen. Oh no. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, as I was introduced, I am Dr. Emily Hills, a research scientist at UT Austin. My background is in neurodevelopment and uh, behavioral neuroscience, and I have been studying endocrine disruptors for the last just about four years now. And today I'm going to be talking about minimizing plastic use as cancer risk reduction. So to get started, why is exposure to plastic a public health concern? Plastics are made from a large range of polymers, including things like polyethylene, PVC, and nylon. These polymers are typically derived from petrochemical processes. Uh, petrochemical engineering exposes people to high levels of toxic cancers or toxic chemicals, and cancer rates have been observed to be nearly 50% higher in regions that have many petrochemical engineering facilities. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about petrochemicals. With plastics, various additives are included that are used to enhance their properties. These include things like plasticizers, which increase the flexibility of plastic, stabilizers that prevent plastic degradation, and pigments for added color. And there's evidence which suggests links between exposure to these chemical additives in plastic and specific health impacts, specifically to the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a collection of organs in the body that are uh, hormone regulated. Um, this includes things like the brain, including the hypothalamus and pituitary, the thyroid, and of course the reproductive system in females, the uterus and ovaries, and in males, the testes. The endocrine system controls the body's hormones and regulates our metabolism, growth, reproductive system, and cognitive function, among other things. And it's responsive to very small hormonal changes. 
So what are endocrine disruptors? Endocrine disruptors are chemicals that can disturb the body's hormone systems and are known to cause adverse health effects, including things like cancer, diabetes, reproductive disorders, and neurological impairments. Endocrine disruptors are concerning because they occur naturally, well, not naturally, but they we are exposed to them in the environment at very low doses, and these very low doses have been shown to cause harm. The amounts that we are exposed to on an everyday basis, which are usually considered safe and standard toxicological tests, uh, often can still impact the body's endocrine system and interact with its hormones. Observing the effects of endocrine disruptors can be difficult because sometimes the adverse effects that they exert, they exert can be very delayed. Um, effects can occur years after the initial exposure and at times even multiple generations pass before we see the development of an adverse health effect. Also, the effects of endocrine disruptors can be at times irreversible because they in fact impact genetic processes. During windows of high vulnerability, such as a pregnant woman, um, the developing fetus's future health can be damaged beyond repair. Finally, the effects of endocrine disruptors are largely overlooked, and this is because current toxicological safety testings do not adequately um, assess the endocrine-mediated effects of EDCs. So when I get started talking about EDCs, I like to mention some of the most concerning health effects that we have been observing over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, we have seen that male fertility is declining. We've seen over a 40% reduction in sperm counts in men across the world since the 1970s. We've also noticed noted that breast cancer diagnosis in women, particularly young women, is increasing by 3% every year and recently overtook lung cancer as the number one cause of cancer-related death in women. And finally, worldwide obesity rates have more than doubled since 1980, and which can't be explained by life factors alone. When you control for things like Western diet, we still see these effects. And each of these adverse health effects have been attributed, at least in part, to our increasing exposure to chemicals found in plastics and a variety of other products. Public awareness of the harmful effects of industrial chemicals is high, but our awareness of personal routes of exposure is much lower. So what type of endocrine disruptors are found in plastic? According to the US Endocrine Society, there are 144 chemicals known to be hazardous to human health found in plastic. These are used for things like as antimicrobials, pigments, flame retardants, plasticizers and stabilizers, as well as solvents. Endocrine disruptors affect normal endocrine signaling via a variety of hormone-mediated processes, processes, but the best studied of these is their effects on nuclear hormone receptors. In normal endocrine signaling, a hormone will bind to a hormone receptor and instigate a cellular response. Endocrine disrupting chemicals have a similar structure to the body's natural hormones, which means that they can interact with our cells uh, hormone receptors and either create too much of a response or block the responding entirely. This would be either agonist or antagonistic properties of endocrine disrupting chemicals. So of the EDCs commonly used in plastic, the one that most people would be familiar with would be bisphenols. Bisphenols are used to make polycarbonate plastics and epoxy resins, and we're exposed to them because they can leach into food and beverages from the plastics over time. BPA has been shown to affect fertility, reproductive development and function, brain development, it affects function of the thyroid, and it's associated with increased cognitive disorder in children. There are over 7,000 research, research papers that support the harmful effects of BPA, and many countries, including the U.S., have restricted or banned its use in certain products. Another class of EDCs used in plastics are phthalates. These are used to promote or produce flexibility, which means they're plasticizers, and they help stabilize PVC plastics. They can be found in things like medical devices, food packaging, children's toys, and they're also used in personal care products as emulsifiers for fragrances. 
Exposure to phthalates occurs via oral ingestion, such as children chewing on plastic toys, inhalation via dust in the air, and contact with our skin. Phthalates have been shown to reduce testosterone and estrogen levels, as well as block thyroid hormone action, and they are known reproductive toxicants. Phthalate syndrome is a developmental disorder that causes malformation of the male reproductive system, specifically when, occurs, when exposure to phthalates occurs during early gestational development. Some phthalates, including DEHP and DBP, are banned for use in children toys and children contact products in the U.S., but there are many more still used regularly in plastics. Perfluorinated chemicals, or PFOS, are another class of endocrine disruptors in plastic. Many of you are probably familiar with the term forever chemicals, and this refers to PFOS. In plastics, they're used to make fluoropolymers, um, which are nonstick surfaces that have high temperature resistance. You can find this in things like pipes, valves, and pumps, or things that might be under your house or hidden away in things that you're not coming into contact with quite so often. Our primary exposure to PFOS comes through water, but we also get exposed to things uh, to PFAS in things like cookware and in fast food wrappers that have nonstick properties. I think McDonald's uh, just recently began phasing out PFAS in their own fast food wrappers. Um, PFAS affect the immune system, liver, and thyroid function, and they're also associated with endocrine mediated cancers. Another class is brominated flame retardants or BFRs, which reduce the flammability of plastic products. These are found in things like electronic casings and wiring coast and wire coatings, uh, plastic children choice, and in recycled plastics. Our exposure to BFRs primarily occurs via inhalation because these things are found in indoor dust and oral contact, such as children chewing on products. And BFRs are associated with many of the health disruptions that I've discussed for the other EDCs so far. The final class I'd like to talk about are dioxins. Dioxins are considered the world's most toxic substances, and they are released when plastic is burned or is heated for recycling. Manufacturing, recycling, and e-waste landfills have high dioxin exposures. And the main health concern of exposure to dioxins are their cancer-causing attributes, but they also have endocrine-mediated health effects, including on the reproductive, metabolic, and developmental systems. So now that I've given you guys a breakdown of what are some of the more common EDCs and plastics and noted a few of them which have been banned for use in certain countries, I'd like to talk about a phenomenon called regrettable substitution. Regrettable, substi re bleh, sorry. <laughs> regrettable substitution is a phenomenon wherein a harmful chemical is replaced with a structurally similar substitute that has similar or potentially worse toxicological effects. This is well known in the in um, bisphenols. The story behind bisphenols is that once upon a time, BPA was used very commonly in plastic products and in food containers, uh, canned foods. But over time, research began emerging that linked exposure to BPA with things like breast cancer, infertility, and altered reproductive and neurological function. And so people began to demand change and companies responded. Now it's very common to see products labeled as BPA free, which is progress, but at the same time, BPA free doesn't mean BP free. Uh, chemicals that are, or products that are advertised as BPA free often contain replacement bisphenols such as BPF, BPAF, and BPS. And emerging research has been consistently showing that these or structurally similar substitutes exert the same biological effects as BPA did. So other examples include replacement phthalates. We have PFOS, which was replaced with Gen X. We see that PCBs were replaced with PBDEs and then other flame retardants. And this is an issue because scientific scrutiny simply cannot keep up with next gen chemical manufacturing. It takes years to create a body of research that is convincing enough to move the public to demand action and create either regulatory or industrial-led change. And it only takes a short amount of time to create a regrettable substitute to take that chemical's place and the cycle starts over again. 
There's been a lot of attention given to micro and nanoplastics in recent years. Micro and nanoplastics are small plastic particles that come from the degradation of plastics. They are persistent in the environment and they are found everywhere, including in the endocrine tissues of the body. Uh, research has found evidence for microplastics in the placenta and even crossing into the fetal brain. I have seen a lot of memes recently about the detection of microplastics in the testicles. So they are really targeting endocrine tissues and fatty tissues throughout the body. And the reason that micro and nanoplastics are a health concern is because the same chemical additives used in plastic manufacturing are found in microplastics. And this means that these small plastics within your tissue represent a constant and continuous route of exposure to those chemical additives leaching into your tissue. Now that I've given you guys some background on plastics, I wanna talk about endocrine-mediated cancers. Endocrine-mediated cancers target tissues and cells of the endocrine system. This can cause rapid cell growth of endocrine cells, which in some cases can actually increase hormone production and disrupt hormonal balance because the cancerous cells can produce hormones on their own if they're in specific tissues. Common endocrine cancers include thyroid, breast, prostate, ovarian, and testicular cancer, but really can target any endocrine tissue of the body. We first observed endocrine-mediated cancers in the context of EDCs from diethylsilvestrol, or DES. DES was a synthetic estrogen prescribed widely in the 1940s to prevent pregnancy complications and losses. It was actually proven ineffectual at this and potentially harmful in the 1950s. Uh, however, due to an aggressive ad campaign, it remained in use up until the 1971, after which evidence of a rare vaginal cancer forming in daughters of mothers who were taking DES became clear. Many women were not actually informed that they were taking DES, but after this evidence of increased cancer risk emerged, um, DES was banned for use of pre pregnant women. However, we're still seeing the health effects of DES today. We find that these effects ex have extended to grandchildren, and we're observing a broad increase of adverse health effects in children of mothers who were prescribed DES, um, including things like reproductive abnormalities and increased risk of uh, developing cancer. There's uh, ample evidence for endocrine-mediated cancers coming from exposure to EDCs and plastic. In this pie chart I'm showing, you can see a broad collection of the health effects of specific EDCs, um, including things like reproductive effects in this very large slice of the pie. Um, this is the scientific evidence that connects EDC exposure with adverse health effects in human and animals. Um, of this, about 453 and 129 are related to cancer development and tumor development. That's 582 research articles linking exposure to EDCs with increased risk of cancer and tumors. And importantly, this is only in human and rodent models and doesn't account for a large body of in vitro evidence. Of that, there are 156 research articles that link EDCs found in plastics with increased risk of cancer and 48 with tumor development. This is a pretty large body of research, particularly considering that a good amount of it has been conducted in humans. EDCs increase risk for cancer or stimulate cancer progression directly via their genotoxic or carcinogenic effects. These are typically affected or typically observed with things like dioxin and lead or in high level exposure scenarios, such as an industrial spill. In everyday life, people are typically exposed to EDCs and plastics at much lower levels than what you would see in those scenarios. And this affects cancer risk and progression via more subtle mechanisms. The first of these would be oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is an imbalance between unstable reoxygen, reactive oxygen species, or ROS, which are uh, free radical molecules containing oxygen, and our body's natural antioxidant defense systems. RRS are generated as byproducts of normal cellular metabolism, which means that our cells create ROS as it's functioning normally. However, 
We also see increased ROS production via a variety of environmental sources. This can be from things like diet, smoking, and uh, exercise, and EDCs. Um, ROS production plays an important role in the initiation and progression of cancer. This is because when the balance between ROS and antioxidants becomes disrupted, uh, we see rapid cell growth leading to protein and DNA damage and ultimately resulting in cell death when ROS levels are increased. The EDCs found in plastics promote ROS generation, and this is linked with increased endocrine-mediated cancer risk. Another mechanism via which EDCs can increase cancer risk is via epigenetic dysregulation. Epigenetics broadly refers to changes in gene function without altering DNA or your natural nature versus nurture paradigm. Some epigenetic mechanisms include histone modifications, DNA methylation, chromatin remodeling, and actions on non-coding RNAs. Of these, DNA methylation is known to alter gene expression by either turning on or turning off genes. Like ROS production, it's essential for normal developmental function, and this is a process that uh, happens very early in life when there are periods of massive D and remethylation in the developing brain. EDCs can induce epigenetic alterations to genes that are implicated in various cancers. Of these, nuclear hormone receptors are well known for their role in cancer progression, and EDCs can affect expression of nuclear hormone receptors via their actions on DNA methyltransferases. The final mechanism via which EDCs can affect cancer risk and progression is disrupted hormonal signaling. EDCs can affect hormone signaling, which leads to altered cell proliferation and a state of carcinogenesis. And they do this by targeting nuclear hormone receptors, which are transcription factors that regulate gene activity in response to hormones. In this diagram, I'm showing a hormone interacting with a hormone receptor and signaling the DNA in the cell to begin dividing. In a normal situation, this will be a positive feedback loop where the cell will know to turn off after a certain point and create a normal state of uh, homeostasis. However, EDCs that bind nuclear hormone receptors can cause increased cell growth and create an environment suitable for cancer progressor progression. They can do this by acting as hormone mimics to increase cell proliferation or by altering the number of hormone receptors to make the cell more reactive to hormonal disruptions. What I've discussed so far represents a multiplicative environment. EDCs induce a cascade of, of biological events that interact with and compound upon one another. For example, exposure to BPA in utero is associated with increased levels of oxidative stress. This oxidative stress can induce epigenetic dysregulation or hypermethylation of genes like the estrogen receptor and ultimately results in reproductive abnormalities. In this example, I've provided male rats. Moreover, these levels do also interact with one another. Each biological process feeds back into the others. So for example, disrupted hormone signaling, particularly in early life, can impart epigenetic marks that lead to further disrupted hormonal signaling in later life. And similarly for oxidative stress, we see hormonal disruptions in early life create a situation where uh, there's a higher generation of reactive oxygen species and the cycle starts over with epigenetic dysregulation and hormones, altered hormone signaling function. These are the ways that EDCs can impact the cancer risk and progression timeline. So let's talk about mitigation. Um, I'm going to talk about plastics, recycling, and replacements for plastics, um, as well as chemoprotective agents and ways to reduce your exposure to EDCs in plastics and in other products. So plastics recycling are, is a great method for decreasing plastics pollution. However, when plastics are recycled, the process often involves the melting and reforming of plastic materials, and the adding added mechanical and heat stress during the recycling process actually creates a less stable form of plastic. And research shows that 
EDCs more easily leach out of these plastics and into their contents. Plastic degradation also, or not only freeze bound EDCs, but because plastics are all often recycled in large bas batches, which may have mixes of different types of plastic in them, it can create new harmful compounds. Another method for reducing plastics use is bioplastics, which have received a lot of attention recently, but people are questioning if they are less harmful as an alternative to plastics. While they are biodegradable and come from renewable resources, which can be used to reduce the problem of plastic waste, we have found that most bioplastics, including those made from plants, contain the same chemical additives as traditional plastics. That would be your plasticizers, UV stabilizers, and uh, pigments, to name a few. And those chemical additives have similar toxicological profiles as traditional plastic, which means that bioplastics might not represent a less harmful alternative to standard plastic. When it comes to reducing our exposure to EDCs and plastic, replacing plastics in our lives is the best option, um, that be it traditional, recycled, or bioplastics. We should, um, I provided an example of a few ways in which you can reduce the use of plastics in your life. Uh, for example, you can invest in glass Tupperware or use ceramic, glass, wood, or metal products at home in the kitchen. Uh, there's evidence, for example, that plastic cutting boards release thousands of microplastics into food. You could also look into getting a metal or glass water bottle. And keep in mind that not all plastics contain EDCs. So most plastics contain a number on the bottom, and you can use this to identify whether or the likelihood that the plastic you're using is likely to contain EDCs. Plastics in the one, two, four, and five category are considered safer, while plastics in the three, six, and seven categories are known to contain um, EDCs. It's also true that while avoiding plastics entirely would be ideal, it's not feasible for most people. So instead we can work to increase awareness of ways to use plastic that reduces EDC leaching into the contents. Uh, you could do this by throwing out plastics with obvious signs of etching or a cloudy appearance. And one of my favorite recommendations is not to heat plastics. Heat exacerbates the rate that chemicals contained in plastic leach into their contents. So you can move food into a ceramic bowl before heating in the microwave or wash plastics by hand instead of using the dishwasher. And, and additionally, you can throw out products that have been exposed to excessive heat. For example, a water bottle that was left in your car over the, sum over the summer. Um, it also helps to be mindful of what is contained in plastic. Um, acidic foods and drinks can increase the rate of chemical leaching into the contents contained in plastic. And then finally, keeping single-use plastics single-use. Um, reusing disposable water bottles or Ziploc bags increases both the breakdown of the plastic and EDC leaching from it, and it also increases microbial growth. I know I am somebody who likes to reuse my single-use plastics, so you can find uses for these products that's not food or body contact, and that can help reduce your exposure. Diet can also be a great tool for reducing our exposures to EDCs. Um, in this experiment, using the NHANES from the CDC study, um, it was shown that improved dietary quality is associated with lower BPA and BPF concentrations in human urine. Um, higher scores for things like total fruits and vegetables, as well as whole grains, were associated with lower bisphenol concentrations and higher intake of just plain tap water were also associated with lower bisphenol concentrations. On the other side of this, higher intake of things like bottled water and eating more meals from fast food or frozen meals were associated with higher BPA concentrations. And these associations remain even when controlling for things like sociodemographics, which is just representing um, that our diet is a 
primary source of our exposure to EDCs, either via foods coming into contact with plastics or coming into contact with EDCs and other sources, such as um, the uh, agricultural process. We can also talk a little bit about chemoprotective agents and ways that we can help reduce or lower our risk of developing cancer. Uh, antioxidants are chemoprotective agents that neutralize reactive oxygen species and other free radicals um, via electron donation. Antioxidants uh, donate an electron to these unbalanced free radical cells, creating a stable molecule and preventing further cellular reaction. Antioxidants can also directly react with ROS to form less reactive molecules and stimulate the production of endogenous antioxidant enzymes. So they can actually be very helpful in terms of the uh, oxidative stress mechanism for EDC mediated cancer risk. Some chemoprotective agents include flavonoids, which are found in vegetables and fruits, particularly citrus vegetables and fruits, and they act as potent antioxidants. I found this statistic quite impressive. In rats that were given citrus, citrus juices, they showed a 22% reduction in colon cancer and a 29% um, reduction in lung cancer, respectively. Another class would be polyphenols, which are found in grapes, nuts, berries, and many other foods. Uh, this is an antioxidant that protects tissues from DNA damage and apoptosis or cell death after exposure to carcinogenic compounds. Polyphenols have been shown to impair the rate of tumor growth, and they also work synergistically with chemotherapeutic agents to improve uh, therapeutic outcomes in cancer treatment. So fluorophane is one of my favorites. It's found in leafy green vegetables, particularly in broccoli sprouts and in broccoli, and it's effective in preventing and treating various cancers. Uh, so fluorophane has been found to significantly reduce DNA methylation in breast, breast cancer cells and also aids re-expression of tumor suppressor genes. It has known antioxidant effects, and this is one mechanism via which it has these positive impacts. Finally, selenium supplementation can be protective against oxidative stress. Um, always speak with a health healthcare provider before taking supplements, particularly something like selenium, because this could be very harmful if you're over supplementing. But research has shown that supplementing with selenium actually um, reduces BPA-induced testicular damage via reduction in the generation of uh, reactive oxygen species. Endocrine disruptors are used for many purposes beyond plastics production. The same chemicals of concerns found in plastic are used for things like personal care products, where uh, phthalates are used to carry scent and parabens are used as antimicrobials. There is cookware, which I've mentioned, PFOS or Gen X are used in Teflon anti-stick cookware and can also be found in waterproof clothing. Pestify pesticides and fungicides are sprayed onto certain uh, produce, particularly leafy greens directly and represents an oral route of EDC exposure. And then many household items um, are treated with flame retardants. So to reduce your exposure to these other sources, you could do things like looking for fragrance-free or paraben-free products. I've been recently seeing phthalate-free on labels, and I really like that because it addresses the issue of regrettable substitution. Um, you can look for cookware that is not anti-stick, such as steel or ceramic cookware. And you can wash your fruits and vegetables. You have to manually wash them with your hands for about 30 seconds, as well as buying certain organics. Uh, when it comes to buying organics, you can use EWG or the Environmental Working Group's annual guide on highly contaminated produce. This is EWG's Dirty Dozen. It's a helpful guide to know what um, fruits and vegetables you should be avoiding, cleaning, or buying organic. And then you can also buy household items made from natural materials and dust frequently to reduce the accumulation of EDCs and dust. The last thing I will speak about is um, Endoscreen, which is an app that I made um, 
with OWH. This is used for detecting EDCs and personal care products. And the way that it works is you take a picture of a product's ingredients and receive a report back about detected EDCs, their health effects, and links to specific research articles that you can use to read a little bit more. Um, we provide things like the number of articles as a metric to address uncertainty. Um, the health effects are categorized broadly with links to specific articles for further, re for further reading, and it provides comprehensive information about EDCs. So I provided an image of what the endoscreen output looks like. This is a nonprofit that I manage, so it's all home brew. I think I went through that a little faster than I meant to, but thank you all very much for listening to me today. I would be happy to thank my mentor, Dr. Andrea Gore and the Endocrine Society for always supporting my research, as well as the people that I have met doing um, outreach and um, awareness about EDCs, as well as the OASH Office on Women's Health for supporting um, the Development of Endoscreen, and the National Institute of Environmental Health Services for funding my academic research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hills. Virtual round of applause. Um, we have time for a Q&A, and so I just wanted to get to um, Audrey's question. But yes, uh, Teresa, uh, this will be recorded and put on um, our YouTube page, so you can see the slides there. But if I'm sure if you have additional questions, we can get in touch with Dr. Hills. Um, so Audrey said, incredible information. Um, I feel as though we don't hear about these exposures and cancer development as much as some other cancer risks. Can you shed some light on why the connections between plastic exposure, EDCs, and cancer hasn't um, been seemingly widely discussed. There seems to be a huge body of evidence. So thank you for showing some of that research going on, um, pointing toward the prudence of reducing population-wide exposure. That's a great question and a difficult one to address because I think it's multifaceted as well. There is certainly been a lot of work being done at the Endocrine Society and in a lot of interest groups to try and bring attention to these facts and um, create a situation where there would be lobbying efforts to decrease the use of plastics due to their harmful health effects, not just with cancer, but um, with their endocrine mediated health effects um, on the reproductive and metabolic systems, which are where EDCs are best studied. Um, I think one barrier to that is the long latency that occurs between exposure to EDCs and the development of a, of a let's say cancer, since that's what we're talking about. Um, a lot of the adverse health effects that are associated with EDCs are exerted, the mechanisms occur during very early life. So in a pregnant woman being exposed to EDCs. Um, and they're not so much associated with direct exposure um, in your environment as an adult. And this is because the developing fetus has um, a higher sensitivity to hormone disruption than a fully hormonally uh, mature adult does. And so that long latency between exposure and the development of an adverse health outcome makes creating a causal relationship very difficult. And that makes creating policy very difficult, especially in an environment where there are stakeholders who are very invested in the production of plastic and groups that also um, uh, lobby against, against that type of change. So I'd be happy to talk about that more, but does that answer your question? Thank you, okay. Melinda had another great question. Um, have you looked into plastic culture, the increasing use of plastic in agriculture and the migration of plastic particles into soil and therefore plant uptake? No, <laughs> I have not. I have heard research talks on this. I don't know if there is much plant uptake from EDCs and plastics. I think 
there's more evidence for um, insecticides and, and those types of agents. Thanks. Okay, and Brie has her hand raised, so go ahead, Brie. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. This information is all extremely interesting and so helpful. Um, so earlier when you talked about the regrettable substitution, when you're replacing one chemical for another, I was just wondering, um, what you could tell us kind of about like the process when it comes to reformulating and choosing that new chemical. Um, yeah, just anything you might have to say on that. I am not a chemist, so I cannot tell you about the um, chemical engineering process that comes into choosing specific, what we call congeners, which are structurally similar replacements. But I think I can at least shed a little bit of light onto some of the logical steps that go into that process. Um, when it comes to something like, let's say, BPA, you want to use BPA and plastic or, or phthalates to, as a plasticizer to promote the flexibility of the plastic. And when you are reaching to find a suitable alternative, the first consideration any manufacturer is going to have is, okay, I need to find something else that also promotes flexibility in the plastic. And so the EDCs, there's a, such so many BPAs out there. I think there's even more than just, you know, A to Z. Um, so there's a really wide range of them to, to use as options um, to pick from. And they all, because they have this structural similarity, they promote the same things. Um, manufacturers do have an onus of responsibility to do toxicological testing with their products, but currently... Uh, standard toxicological safety testing doesn't include um, the consideration of endocrine mediated health outcomes. And this also kind of loops back to that um, long latency between exposure and the development of an adverse health effects, at times even generations. So in my own research, I do multi-generational research and I expose rats to polychlorinated biphenyls, which are used um, in electron, well, were used, they're banned now, um, but they're resistant to biodegradation. So we still all have them in our bodies. Um, when I exposed rats to this, the direct child, we didn't really see any adverse health effects, but then they began emerging in the second generation. And so that is certainly not something that's being accounted for when manufacturers do safety testing with their chemicals. Thank you. Um, someone did have a quick question. Um, for Endoscreen, is it uploadable on the iPhone or is it just the website? Like people should use the. Yes. So the it's currently just a web app. We are hoping to get further funding and we might develop an iOS and Android sp specific app right now. But I don't know if it's me, but I just I love the idea of not having to download something to be able to use it. So uh, right now it's just the web app. Awesome. Thank you. And that also ties into people have been sharing in the chat different resources that they've seen and used. So I was just curious, um, what resources do you recommend for learning more about endocrine disrupting chemicals? I think the Endocrine Society website has pretty comprehensive information, um, particularly from a healthcare perspective about communicating about EDCs. Um, with stakeholders and also just a lot of um, general information about where EDCs can be found, how they uh, instigate their health effects. And sorry, I got distracted by a question popping up in the chat. <laughs> um, that's a great resource. I, um, I don't have it on me, but there's a really good database of endocrine disrupting chemicals. I used it when I was developing Endoscreen and then kind of updated it because it was developed in 2019 and then updated in 2022. So I wanted to, to get even more recent information, but I could definitely find the link to that. It's called the deduct database, um, D E big D little E big D U C T uh, 2.0. And that's a, that's a very good database for um, looking up specific chemicals um, or even just reading very generally about 
their health impacts and, and where ADCs are and what they do. Thank you. Um, and the question in the chat was, can you talk about how the Environmental Working Group determines their dirty dozen list annually? Unfortunately, I cannot. I do not know how they do that. <laughs> it's like, that'll be one of my follow-up uh, deep dives, because that's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Um, any other questions for Dr. Hills? Feel free to unmute or drop them in the chat. If not, I'm sure Bree can load us up with another one. Um, we'll give it a second. Chat questions. The pre-made yeah. ones were harder. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I also saw them ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bree, I'll let you take it away. I promise I think this might be an easy question. If not, I apologize. Um, I'll survive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so using like the idea of like bioaccumulation and biomagnification. I feel like whenever I've heard about those concepts, it's always been in terms of like heavy metals like mercury. Um, are those still like applicable when it comes to EDCs and plastic? For some and not others, um, this concept is more applicable to EDCs that are lipophallic in nature. Um, so that accumulate in fat and EDCs that accumulate in fat are um, will biomagnify up the food chain. So like I mentioned, PCBs that I study are lipophilic. I think BPA is lipophilic. Um, these are EDCs that you would see biomagnification as a, a route of increased exposure. And then just to make sure I understand, like would then, let's say it's a pregnant person, would the fetus then have like a comparable amount of the EDCs in them, or would that even accumulate then once they're born? If that makes sense, I apologize if it doesn't. <laughs> are you asking, so the mother is eating food that is contaminated or, you know, being exposed to a variety of routes of exposure and how much of that is getting into the fetus and then being carried on? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, there is evidence for that uh, from our labs and others. We have observed particularly um, EDCs that have a long half-life do get transferred from the mother directly to the fetus um, and then can stay in that fetus um, pretty much dependent on the half-life of the EDC. Now, certainly the concentration is going to be lower in the fetus than it is in the mother. Um, but yeah, so that has to do with the half-life of the chemical. Melinda had a question in the chat. Have you seen any research on endocrine disruptor chemical exposure and increases in autism? I guess we could broaden that to behavioral outcomes too. Absolutely. There's a very strong body of research that EDCs impact developmental processes. I don't have, or neurodevelopmental processes. I don't have my graph pulled up, but on that pie chart, there's certainly a cognitive behavioral chunk of the pie. And um, that's where I, as a researcher live, is in this um, neurodevelopmental impacts of EDCs. Um, I study them in the context of ADHD and comorbidity with other um, cognitive behavioral impacts. Uh, Wendy would like to know, are most manufactured plastic water bottles free of these chemicals? This is concerning since our, oh yes, our last presentation talked about Iowa's contaminated water sources. So if people can't drink their tap water, they're turning to bottled water and they're in this sort of they're stuck with like what to drink from. That's a drink. great question. <laughs> they are contaminated with those. So that does represent sort of an inex inescapable exposure situation. Um, I think it would depend, you know, you might be weighing one evil against another. I'd probably pick 
the tap or the the um, plastic water bottle and then keep the use single use. You know, that's an important aspect of this because, you know, chemicals, EDCs don't start leaching out of plastic immediately. It's It's when those plastics get reused or exposed to heat sources or even just like uh, manually um, altered, they begin breaking down and leaching chemicals. So even though in your, you know, fresh off the line, a plastic water bottle is going to have microplastics in it, but that might be better than drinking water that has high levels of PFAS. Audrey reminds us maybe keeping those disposable water bottles in a cool place instead of a hot car might help. Or a hot garage, you know? Yeah. Um, Catherine would like to know, are there in-home filtration systems that seem to work better? Uh, to my knowledge, the best filtration systems are reverse osmosis systems. Um, those seem to be the best at removing EDC contaminants. And then one more from Melinda. Many public water supplies are replacing metal pipes with PVC. Have you seen data on EDC transmission via tap water? I have not seen this data for myself, but I do know that the replacement of metals pipes with PVC is sort of an, a concern in the uh, EDC research community. So I wouldn't be surprised if we begin seeing data on that in the near future. These are really great questions. So please keep them coming if you have any more. Um, We've got a few minutes before we, we wrap up. Oh, perfect. Uh, Catherine would like to, is curious as to the half-life of some of the EDCs. It's a huge range. Um, you have some EDCs that, you know, have a half-life of a few hours to a few days, and then others um, that could be months or years. Um, you know, the reason they're called PFOS is because they never degrade. <laughs> and then, um, you know, some pesticides have a much shorter half-life, so it, it really just depends on the specific chemical. But you can always kind of find that information um, online. Perfect. Yes. And Christine dropped some filtration info in the chat too. Um, we'll make sure the chat is saved at the end of this webinar. So any of the links um, you'll have access to if you need them. Um, okay. With that note, I've got one final question, um, but feel free to flood the chat with compliments or comments. We love compliments here. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Hills, for a really, really awesome presentation and a really great start to a much needed discussion. Again, this was the first time the consortium has really covered plastics use and EDCs. So we're really excited to keep this conversation going. Um, so what role do you see cancer control and public health professionals playing in minimizing plastics use and reducing exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals? I know, and a really easy one. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you all picked, you picked the hardest ones. Um, what role, so I know what role policymakers play. And I think when it comes to other stakeholders in the community, I'm, I'm gonna speak, I guess, more, you know, outside of my, my stage as a an academic and I think it's more of an interpersonal role and an educational role and advocating for whatever policy change you can advocate for while remaining you know nonpartisan <laughs> um, when I'm advocating about EDCs and advocating for awareness about EDCs I've tried a lot of different um, approaches to doing that and the one that I have found that works the best is things like this, organized meetings where, you know, I could present a lot of data to people who are very interested or a lot of face-to-face um, -face events. So like as in my role as Endoscreen, I'll go around to college campuses and set up a little booth and just talk to students on college campuses about what EDCs are, where they can be found, how they can look for products that don't have them. Um, and that has probably been the most effective way for me 
to instigate that kind of change. I don't know how far that goes into people's lives after that, but um, I think the conversation around endocrine disruption has evolved a lot, even in the short amount of time that I've been in the field. And um, for some people, they've just haven't been introduced to the concept at all, or, you know, especially haven't been introduced to evidence back backing the concept. And I think that's really powerful for people. So evidence-backed communication and advocacy would be the role I see. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and thank you for providing us with some of that evidence today. Cause I think the average person just doing a Google search, it's really hard to sort of decipher everything. So this has been really helpful. Um, yeah, I have and, uh, links to all the uh, research that I've spoke about in my awesome. slides. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to highlight Melinda's comment. Um, Melinda hopes you'll consider presenting at dietitian conferences. Your work is terrific. So, oh. yeah, might be. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this and isn't then, my work, though. My work is <laughs> yeah. all cognitive. This is yeah. the work of many people in the endocrine society. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And and Sarah um, just mentioned that um, their medical team recommends reverse osmosis water filtration systems as the best option. So might be a future webinar topic we can explore. Um, but with that, thank you so much again, Dr. Hills. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, and the last part of our webinar series will be next Tuesday, August 13th, same time, 2 p.m. And um, Mahaska Health's occupational health team will be covering uh, conducting exposure histories and talking more about that cumulative risk. Um, so if you can join us for then, please do. I will drop the link in the chat real quick. But with that, um, I think we're, we're done. Thank you so much again, Dr. Hills. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you everyone for joining. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.